You're listening to episode 146, Using Your Past to Make a Positive Impact in the World, with Stacy Johnson. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I'm so grateful to have you here. And today we're going to be joined by Stacey Johnson, founder of Central Texas Table of Grace. Before we get into it, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Navni. Navni is the top-ranked anonymous writing website in the world. Navni provides free wellness resources and low-cost online therapy services to help people cope with various levels of emotional distress. Write anonymously, feel better, at novni.com. So Stacy grew up in the foster care system, and she's going to share with us how that led her to doing the work that she's doing today with her nonprofit organization, Uh, Central Texas Table of Grace. And in particular, she's going to talk about the struggles that she faced in the foster care system, um, the relationship that she was still able to have with her mom while she was in foster care, her experience of going to a group home, how she was able to become emancipated at the age of 16, and what life was like for her after that, um, how the support of a couple of key people helped her to become successful, the ways in which her situation um, have also affected her positively. And she'll share with us the story of how she ended up opening up her shelter. And we'll also talk about what a typical day looks like for her. And you know, you don't have to be in the foster care system or have come from that background yourself to appreciate Stacey's story and be inspired by it. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into this one and I'll go bring Stacey on. Stacey, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Melissa. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Um, So I first learned about you from Oleg Lohid, who I had on the show just a couple episodes back, and I also had the pleasure of meeting you at Oleg's event back in December, which was great. I love it whenever I get to meet a guest of the show in person. Yes. Um, And I'm glad that, you know, we got connected because you have such an inspiring story And I know you'll share with us a little bit about what you went through growing up. And I just love how you've been able to overcome those hardships to be successful today and be giving back and doing the amazing work that you're doing, um, which we'll talk about as well. So what I'd like to do here, Stacey, is have you start us out by sharing with us a summary of what you experienced growing up so that we have that context. And then we'll go from there. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, just kind of, you know, take a minute and share with us what you'd like us to know about what you experienced. Absolutely. So, um, I actually grew up in the foster care system, which led me to what I'm doing today, which I'm the founder and CEO of a, uh, emergency shelter for foster kids. But, um, growing through, going through foster care, um, was definitely the most challenging aspect of my life. I went into foster care when I was two my mom was an alcoholic and, and was unable to take care of me. And so I went into my first foster home when I was two. And I actually lived in that first one until I was 10 years old. Um, but it was a really, really unhealthy, um, emotionally abusive environment. The foster um, mother was really abusive emotionally and, um, you know, really damaged my self-esteem, you know, a lot. And, um, and so when I was, uh, when I was, uh, about 11 years old, um, I had found a a box of cards and letters and things from my biological mom um, in her closet that I had never seen. And she used to tell me if my mom loved me or cared about me, she would try to contact me. And so when I found those letters, I just couldn't believe it. And I told an aunt about it. And I believe she called my caseworker and I was removed from the home within a few days. Wow. I mean, that must have been just really shocking for you to find those. Yeah. And I mean, her, you know, it it just is really sad because my mom was trying to contact me that whole time. And, you know, 
they did allow that foster uh, family to move out of the county uh, after they had had me for a couple of years. And so it made it virtually impossible for my mom who was in poverty to, you know, come visit me or, or anything like that. But she had tried keeping contact with the letters and I just hadn't seen them. And um, so I really wanted to, at that point, see if I could find my biological mom. And so uh, Child Protective Services basically took me out of that foster home and put me in another one just to get me out of that one while, while they looked for a, a, a place closer to my mom. And so the next foster home I was in, it was only a few months until they found me a place by, by my mom. And I developed a relationship with my mom, um, you know, at that time. Um, but unfortunately, she never really was able to get her life together enough to get me back. So I kind of bounced around from foster home to foster home, um, about 10 in all, before I actually asked my caseworker if I could go to a group home. Now, did you remember your mom at all from, you know, I mean, you said you had um, went into the foster home when you were two, right? Mm -hmm. So did you like have any memories or was it like you were meeting her for the first time? I did have some memories because they didn't move out of the county until um, I think I was like five or six. And so um, I would do trial visits with my mom for six, you know, sometimes they would do like a three month or a six month trial period to see if I could, you know, if it could work out. But something that always happened, either my mom would get, you know, arrested for a petty you know, drunk in public or something like that, or, you know, something would happen. Um, I did um, suffer uh, sexual abuse from one of her boyfriends. Um, I actually never told anyone about that, but there was just a lot of reasons why it wasn't going to be able to, to work out with my mom. And I just, she never did just, you know, get it to where I was able to come back. Mm -hmm. And then what was that like for you when you got reconnected with her later on? So it's kind of interesting, actually, some of the best memories I have are with my mom, but um, basically what I would do is, you know, I was when I, you know, between the uh, ages of like 11 and 15, that's when I kind of had kept up, you know, the contact with her and I would ride the city bus downtown um, to go visit her in the park where she lived. <laughs> And she, you know, she had enough resources and friends where she could maybe couch surf every once in a while, but mainly she lived like in the park. Um, and so I would go down there and I remember we would buy like friend, uh, French bread and spinach dip and eclairs and go down into the park and, you know, we'd buy those with her food stamps and we would go down there and eat and talk and, you know, and have a good time. And I, I really enjoyed that relationship with my mom, but it also, I had a lot of anxiety because you know, I would, I always had to fear whether she was going to call me and be drunk or I was going to, you know, I was going to find out she was in jail again, or, you know, sometimes she would be wearing sunglasses to hide her black eyes. And, you know, she definitely had her share of problems. Um, but that relationship probably was, you know, one of the most important things to me because she was my mom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you were able to still have that relationship with her, but it must've been difficult for you to not be able to live with her full time though. Right. Have that, have that stable home life. Yeah. When you're a kid, you just don't understand. You think it's you like, why, why can't she do this for me? Why can't she do this for me? But you know, there's a lot of other things involved when it comes to alcoholism and um, mental illness. I mean, she has had a um, long, a long uh, depression for most of her life. And, um, so, you know, I just don't hold, hold those things against her, but as a child, you just wonder why they can't get it together for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what happened? How long were you in the foster care system for? So what ended up happening, and I believe this is really the catalyst for all my successes in life was when I was 15 years old, I actually asked my social worker if I could just go to a group home because I was just getting sick of getting moved around. I just felt like no one wanted me. And I, kept having to change foster homes for one reason or another. And, you know, it just seemed like no one was going to take care of me or care about me as if I was their own child. So I, I asked my social worker if I could just go to a group home. I said, you know, if I do my chores and I follow the rules, like I could just stay there. Right. And so she said, well, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot like jail. There's a lot of rules and you can't be a normal kid there. I really don't think that you want to want to do that. And I said, yeah, but if I, do my chores and I follow the rules like I could just stay there right and she said well yeah and so she allowed me to go into Lisa Lane group home when I was 15 years old and um, when I got to the group home there was a they had a house therapist there and his name was Russ Hansen and he um, 
I told him that I wanted to get legally emancipated by the time I was 16. And I don't know when the last time you saw a 15 year old, but that's a kid. And <laughs> I knew that this man was not looking at me going, Oh, good idea. You should move out. Like that will be the solution, you know? Um, but he, I'll never forget. He just looked at me and he kind of looked me up and down and he goes, well, you're a little rough around the edges, but you can do it. And we're going to have to get right to work. He's like, you're going to have to get a job. You're going to have to get a savings account. You're going to have to do all these things because a judge is never going to emancipate you unless he knows for a fact that you can make it on your own. And so he bought me this book called the seven habits of highly effective teens. And he helped me um, get a job. And, you know, I just went through the steps and I ended up going before a judge at the age of 16 and he granted my emancipation. So I was on my own uh, from 16 on after that. Wow. And why do you think it was so important for you to become emancipated? I think, you know, it was a little mixture. I mean, on one hand, it was like, well, I can take care of myself better than anyone else can. I mean, I keep getting dumped. And then another part of that, to be 100% honest with you, was that teenage mindset of, hey, if I get emancipated, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't have any parents and, you know, I can. No more rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so um, you realize, though, that there may not be rules, but there's a real world out there that imposes rules on you. <laughs> you've got to go to work and you've got to make money. You don't get to just uh, go party all the time. <laughs> So what was that like for you after you became emancipated? So I will be 100% transparent that it was hard. It was the hardest thing. You know, I remember sometimes, you know, scrounging in the couch for change and, you know, going to get a um, Carl's Jr. spicy chicken sandwich, you know, for a dollar. And that was like what I ate that day, you know, um, because just living on, you know, um, it wasn't quite minimum wage because I was a, a certified nursing assistant. Um, and so I made a couple dollars more than minimum wage. So it was a good living that I was uh, making, but still not, you know, you know, at that time, I think it was what, maybe $8 an hour when minimum wage was like $6 uh, and something. And so, um, but you know, you live paycheck to paycheck and you, you've got to, um, you know, take responsibility. And, you know, I remember, um, the couple times that I would, you know, overdraw my bank account and have like hundreds of dollars in overdraft fees and just feeling like completely hopeless, like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? And I'm um, just kind of having to get through those trials and tribulations that ultimately became successful. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine how that must have set you up, you know, to be successful because it's, it's almost like trial by fire in that situation, right? And, you know, most of us, um, you know, if, if we're fortunate to have a stable home life, you know, we learn sort of those skills that we need. Um, to go out and, and live on our own and to be independent. Um, and it sounds like, you know, in your case, that was kind of lacking for you, given the instability that you had. Um, and here you were, you know, thrown into this situation at, at such a young age. And yet, you know, you were able to make it. And so, you know, I can only imagine, you know, how that experience, you know, has, has shaped you into who you are today and the skills that you have now. Yeah. And I will say that a lot of my, um, bosses ended up turning into sort of natural mentors and sort of helped raise me up. You know, I remember um, going into an insurance firm when I was 20, you know, with no, no experience or anything and applying for a job as an insurance agent. And the branch manager just sort of, you know, he was like, you know, I don't think that they're going to let me hire you. You're too young. You don't have a college degree, which we usually prefer a degree. Um, but there's something about, you and I just really, you know, think that you could do a good job here. So, you know, let's just do what we can and I'll do what I can to support you and get my boss to allow me to hire you. And so I did end up getting hired at that insurance firm at the age of 20. And I mean, my first year I made $78,000 and, you know, um, did really well. And, uh, that boss just really, I worked there for the next eight years and I feel like he sort of raised me up and and uh, helped me um, kind of navigate life. And so I was fortunate with that as well. Mm. Yeah, what I'm hearing there is you've had a couple of people, you know, that were really supportive of you up to this point in your life and that that was, you know, hugely beneficial to you and to your success. Oh, absolutely. There's a, um, a, guy, a speaker named Josh Shipp who, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he- I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, so he grew up in foster care and he always says, you know, it only takes one caring adult to help a child become a success story rather than a statistic. And I think that's just exactly 
what I was lucky to have is, you know, um, from that therapist in the group home to, like I said, some of my bosses who became natural mentors, like, you know, having some caring adults around, um, really can make a difference. And, you know, that therapist was only in my life for six months, but I believe he changed the trajectory of my, my entire life. Yeah, it's so important to have support, you know, regardless of what you're going through. You know, having that support is just going to make it that much easier. And, you know, who knows? Like, I mean, you said, you know, it changed the trajectory of your life. And just to have that support, you know, can do that. And who knows, you know, where someone could end up if they don't have that support. Um, so it's just, it's, it's really so important. Um, you know, I think for those who are, who are going through something to be able to reach out for support. And also for those who see someone struggling, you know, to, to know enough to reach out and to offer support to them. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just small things that can just change someone's um, entire day or their, or even their entire life. And so that, that is something that I do, um, you know, really, try to talk to my employees about and, and things like that is just, you know, your every interaction with these kids um, can mean something bigger than you would ever imagine. So. Yeah. So, you know, while obviously, um, you know, you are, are doing well today and everything, um, tell us about like, in what ways, I mean, do you think that you were affected by not having that stability while you were growing up? So I definitely still, you know, with all the therapy and everything that I, cause you know, um, when I, when I was in foster care, you know, therapy is mandatory. So I've, I've been in therapy my whole life and then continued even into, into my adult life. But ever since that, um, therapist got, gave me that seven habits book, I've been really interested in sort of the self-improvement genre. And so I feel like so much of the knowledge I have um, has been from my love of, you know, self-improvement books and things like that. But even after all the therapy and every self-help book, I think that sometimes we still have little scars that, that might never go away. And so I definitely have a little bit of that, you know, fear of abandonment and, you know, sometimes self-esteem issues um, from that because, you know, as a child, when you're a sponge, you know, getting told that you're not good enough or being treated like you're not good enough and, you know, going through sexual abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse, you, you know, the constant message is that you're not good enough and that you're not worth it. And so I think that's bound to have an effect on, on anybody. Um, and I think that um, even with therapy, sometimes we still have some lasting marks, but, um, you know, I'm happy to say that I, I, I am, happy and successful and feel good. But I think there's still a, a tinge of that here and there, for, you know, from that um, childhood abuse. Yeah, of course. I mean, those things just kind of, they stay with us, you know, especially when you go through that stuff when you're so young, it just shapes who you are, becomes a part of who you are. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's great that you've been able to do the work to get to where you are today and, and to not be in a place where it's holding you back. You know, you're able to be successful and, and be giving back and helping others. Um, are there any other ways that you feel like you were affected after, you know, you, you got out of um, the situation? Not definitely. Cause there's definitely not, it's definitely not all negative ways. I mean, mm -hmm. what I say to my kids all the time is that, you know, what you're going through is really hard right now, but you're going to be a tough cookie later <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to think, gosh, you know, when life throws you a problem, it's going to be like, well, I've already gone through losing my family. I've already gone through foster care. I've already gone through this and that. I mean, I can get through anything. And um, I think that, you know, it's affected me in a lot of positive ways, too, because I feel like I just had to learn how to figure it out. And I think um, just being in a place where you can figure things out puts you ahead in this world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, I, I love that you bring that up, that, you know, you were affected positively as well. And there are, you know, th these skills that you have now um, as a result of what you went through. And absolutely, you know. Um, we go through these experiences and of course they affect us negatively. Um, but on the flip side of that, you know, we can see some positive effects as well, um, as a re result of having gone through those things because they, they do make us, you know, stronger and more resilient, right? They can certainly have that effect as well. And those are skills that, you know, we can take with us 
into our adulthood and, and use for good and use to, to be successful. Um, so I can definitely see how, you know, you've been able to do that. And especially, you know, in your situation where you had to um, sort of figure things out on your own when, well, once you became emancipated. Um, so Stacey, share with us, you know, more about, um, you know, the things that, that have really played a role in you getting to where you are today. Well, um, I was, how I ended up opening the shelter and um, cause I have a 13 bed emergency shelter for foster kids and we take kids between the ages of six and 17. And one of the things I wanted to mention too, is just here I am, you know, the, the founder of a, of a non a successful nonprofit. We've been open for about four years and, um, it's, literally every day when I drive to work, it's like, I have to pinch myself because I can't believe this is my life. Like I couldn't be happier. I can't believe that I get to help kids like me. And every day I wake up and I have a passion and I get fulfilled every day. And I just, I literally can't believe I'm here. But one of the things that I want to bring attention to is that, you know, when is that the, the, one of the very first things that happened for me to start on this path of opening my own, um, nonprofit was that someone encouraged me to do it. I mean, I told someone about my dream and they said, well, if that's your dream, you should just do it. And I think in this day and age, we have so many friends and family members that like to play the devil's advocate or like to tell you, you know, that, oh, that's a little risky or I don't know, you know, this or that. Um, but this person, you know, just encouraged me and said, you know, if that's your dream, you should just do it. Um, they sent me an ebook called the step-by-step -step guide to opening a group home. And the next day I had read the entire book and was like on step five and just started going for it. And all these doors just opened one after another, one miracle after another. And one year later, table of grace was opened. And so I just look back on all those people that supported me throughout the way, especially that first person who just encouraged me to do it. And, and that's all I needed was that little spark. and. And then, and then here I am today. And so I just, it's affected me in that, you know, anytime they've actually started to share my story in the licensing class, because, you know, I'm licensed by the state of Texas as a facility that can take, you know, kids in the foster care system. And so they've started to talk about me in their licensing class as an example of someone that was able to, to make it and open a shelter. And so sometimes people will call me for advice on, you know, they're looking at opening a facility or something. And, you know, I, I just make sure that I'm always, you know, that I'm real with them about what, what it is, but that I, I never discourage people because I think that, um, there's never a reason to discourage someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so amazing what you're doing now. And now do the, the kids coming into the shelter know about your background and that, you know, you're, you can relate to them. Yes, they do. I try to meet with every kid when they first come in and and talk to them about and just sort of welcome them and, and let them know why I'm here and why I open the shelter. And I think that it really gives them um, sort of an immediate sense of calm and, and trust because they they can see that I'm doing it for, for the right reasons. Because, you know, there are a lot of um, places that are are not good. And so a lot of our kiddos come into the shelter and they've been in 18 foster homes already and they've been, you know, in three or four facilities already or they just came from the psych hospital. And um, I think that it just really gives them that sense of trust right off the bat because it's like I'm, I'm one of them, you know. And uh, I also was really blessed to be featured in our local, the Austin American Statesman, which is our local newspaper. And then um, I was on the cover of Austin Woman Magazine in July. And so I had those um, made into those plaques and um, put into the shelter so that the kiddos, if I don't happen to get to um, introduce myself right away when they come, they can read about my story and they can see, you know, um, the story of, of, of Table of Grace. So mm, That's really great. I love how you take that time to connect with them and just let them know that you understand where they're coming from. And I can only imagine that that makes them feel you know, so much more comfortable being there just to, to know that someone, you know, gets them and they probably, it, you know, that might be the first time that they've had that happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we, we do a lot of different things at our shelter, you know, that other shelters don't do. I mean, we, 
Um, it's just kind of obvious right off the bat that we're different. I mean, when they first get there, they get, you know, a, a welcome basket that's about, you know, it's about two feet wide, you know, that, um, that has, you know, probably $150 value. It has like a fuzzy blanket and fuzzy socks and, you know, some healthy snacks and a water bottle and, um, the girls get a full like makeup bag and, um, you know, all their hygiene supplies and everything. And they get an MP3 player so that they can, because music is such a great coping skill um, for these kiddos. So we, you know, put an MP3 player in there in case they don't have a phone uh, to listen to music on. And, um, you know, we just really welcome them in and, and, and show them that we're excited to have them there and that we're going to take care of them and they're going to be safe. Mm-hmm. That's really great. Do you have any uh, future plans for the shelter or just any future plans in general that you want to share? Well, I actually do. It's kind of exciting. I um, recently just um, became aware that one of the kiddos that lived with me um, for about eight or nine months um, had turned 18 and had become homeless. Um, A lot of foster kids um, do become homeless for a lot of various reasons, but, um, you know, sometimes it's as simple as they don't have an ID and it's just too much red tape. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have a social. They don't know how to go about doing it and they're couch surfing and they're just, they just end up in a bad spot. And so, um, I became aware that he was homeless and I just, I mean, it was one of my kids and I just couldn't even imagine, um, you know, I just couldn't imagine just saying, okay, well, I'm sorry you're on the street. Um, let me know how you're doing. You know what I mean? So I, I felt like I, I was just, I had to take action. And so I decided that, um, table of grace was just going to take him on as a, as a mentee and just do whatever we had to do to get him back on, on his feet. So I worked out a deal with a local Airbnb host and, um, you know, I've been using my resources to help get him a job. And, you know, I've been reading the seven habits book with him and I'm just kind of doing what I can to give him a chance. And it really, really, um, just ignited a passion in me that, you know, it's time to, to do something else. And I would really, really like to open a transitional living um, program for kids between the ages of 18 and 24 that have aged out that are having a hard time because um, a lot of it is just simply, they just need a little guidance. And, you know, when, when, when this kid called me and I was trying to help him figure out his problems, I mean, it took him four days before he, I noticed that he wasn't wearing his glasses. And I said, Hey, where's your glasses? And he's like, well, I lost them. And I, I said, well, can you see? And he goes, yeah, I can see it close, but not far away. And I said, well, how far can you see? And he held his hand up about eight inches from his face and said about that far. Oh, wow. And I thought, so I took him down. I got glasses. It was, you know, $300 later after the exam and in the glasses and everything. And I thought, you know, how could he be, how could he have even um, overcome this obstacle? I mean, he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a stable place to stay. He can't see more than a foot in front of his face. How would he even overcome that? You know? Yeah. And of course, it's not like, you know, you you turn 18 and automatically, you know, you have everything all figured out and you can be on your own. I mean, sometimes, you know, some people will need a little extra time and need some more support. And especially, you know, kids who are coming from, you know, a forced situation. So I think it's great that you identify that as an issue and you're, you're working to create something to support them. Well, many of them, there are programs out there here, but they're, you know, full. And then because of how full they are, they've got to take the cream of the crop. Like the kids that already have their diploma, already have a job, like already have it completely together. Well, what about the kids that, you know, aren't going to have as easy of a time holding down a job and aren't, you know, do need that extra help. I mean, they're just going to get out and just, they're set up for failure. And, a lot of times these kids, because of the trauma, they're not, um, mentally 18. And I mean, 18 is still young, even for quote, normal kid that had a normal upbringing 18. And still sometimes they can't quite, you know, make it on their own. But you know, when they have all this trauma and they're in foster care, they're a lot of times really in their mind, a lot younger than, than actually 18. So it's like putting a 15 year old out there on the street and saying, okay, go figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not easy to do. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, it sounds like, you know, you just, you're doing well and you have a lot of exciting things going on and you're just doing some good work in the world. So that's awesome. Thanks. What does a typical day look like for you? 
So as the founder and CEO, I'm not in the shelter as much as I used to be. I mean, when I first opened, I did the food shopping. I mean, I, I did everything. Did everything. <laughs> now I'm more um, uh, fundraising, community engagement, um, and things like that. And then I kind of, I joke around that I'm like the grandma because now I'll just go to the shelter like on a Friday and just pop in and do a really expensive activity and then leave. <laughs> um, so I always joke that I'm like the grandma because I'll just pop in when I, you know, when I can. But, um, you know, I really just, my favorite part of my job is when I do get to see my kiddos. So I'm really excited that, you know, I just recently got a full-time assistant and I, you know, have some help with marketing now. And, you know, because before I was the marketing department, the activities department, <laughs> you know, and, mm-hmm. all that. and so now that I have that help, I've been able to sort of concentrate on, you know, going out there and, um, you know, getting into my community and, you know, trying to get more grants and more, more, more support from our community. And, um, and then I also have time to go see my kiddos, which is my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So Stacy, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Just to hang in there um, and that, um, you know, one thing I really wish I knew what at a younger age was about um, fitness, um, about eating healthy and fitness, because in my 20s, I discovered, you know, working out and fitness and, you know, um, and, you know, did a lot of research about food and things like that. And I wish I would have known that when I was younger, because I found that exercise just really, really helps you know, mentally and physically, um, with just about every aspect of life. And so I kind of wish I would have learned about fitness a little earlier in life. Um, but just, I would have told myself to hang in there and just be yourself because, you know, this too shall pass, you know, anybody that's going through a hard time, you know, the, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, focusing on, on your health and, and fitness and diet and all that stuff is, is so important. It does make a huge difference. Um, and I think it's just, it's one of those things that can get overlooked um, when you're just trying to figure other stuff out, you know, and maybe it's not really a, you know, a priority for you at the time, but definitely an important thing and, and can certainly help in, for anyone, you know, in, in their recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, before I let you go, what is the best way for people to connect with you or find out more about what you have going on? So we're on Facebook, um, Central Texas Table of Race, and we have a website, um, Central, uh, uh, hello, <laughs> Central Texas Table of Race.org. Um, and um, Facebook is really great because you can see a lot of pictures of our kiddos and we post a lot about what we have going on. We can't post pictures of their faces due to privacy reasons, but those are our real kids. We put emojis over their face um, <laughs> so that we can kind of show you the reality of what's going on. And I can guarantee that if you could see those beautiful smiles, it would it would make a much bigger impact. But at least you can kind of see um, kind of things we do for our kids and and um, what we have going on in the in the different news and everything. And of course. Um, every bit of exposure that we get really helps. So I want to thank you, Melissa, for having us um, on. And um, because it just really just when people see what we're doing, they want to help. And and so any exposure that we get is just really helpful for us. So even just sharing a Facebook post or liking our Facebook page or anything like that is helpful to us, of course. Yeah, that's great. So and glad to have you on here. And, and thank you, Stacy, for coming on today. Uh, and for sharing your story with us and, you know, talking with us about this great work that you're doing. And I wish you luck with, with that and just, you know, hope that you'll continue to do this great work and, and help these kids who really need it. And um, you know, just continuing to inspire and sharing your story. Well, thank you, Melissa. And I hope you just keep doing what you're doing as well, because it's definitely um, a needed platform. And um, I appreciate everything you're doing as well. All right. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 146. 
Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Stacey Johnson to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you've been inspired by Stacey's story and take home the message that with determination and support, you can achieve what you set your mind to. I love how Stacy has used her past experience to give her the skills to be successful and create her nonprofit and be having the impact that she is right now. And just know that that is possible for anyone. So please don't give up hope no matter what your situation may be. Um, and do check out Central Texas Table of Grace and show it some support if that's something that resonates with you. And come back for the next episode. And in the meantime, you can head over to the website to grab your free copy of the Top 10 Strategies Guide for Survivors. In it, you'll find the top 10 most common strategies my podcast guests have used for overcoming the effects of past trauma. It's a great place to get started if you're looking for some strategies that can help you in your healing, as they have helped my guests. And you can find that at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash guide, or also on the show notes page. So be sure to grab that if you haven't yet. And lastly, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Thank you.